Okay, so first I'd like to uh, acknowledge the work that's been done by Guido Petrotto and Matteo Giatomessi on this. Uh, it's more about the work and discussions that we had together about what can be done, because we actually didn't do a lot, as you will see. It's more ideas that I will bring, questions that I will bring to you, and I hope that it will uh, help for the discussion that we'll have afterwards. So I'm coming from more the materials design and high throughput uh, efforts. And as you know, there's been, uh, you know, the, the ab initio calculation have contributed quite a lot into <coughs> accelerating this materials design. As you can see from here, so we have seen an increase in the the computational databases which translated directly into more uh, materials being designed, discovered for precise applications. Now, the time that is required to compute a given property depends a lot on the property that you're computing. If you look at the structure, the chemistry or electronic properties, that's quite a small amount of time. If you move to more advanced properties such as the response properties, well, the, 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 the amount of time that is needed to do the calculation increases significantly. And in practice, if I look at the materials project, and these are actually all numbers, as a result of the low amount that is needed to compute those, well, of course, there's in the database a lot of those that have been computed and very little of the others that have been computed. However, still there's a number of those that have been computed. So for instance, there has been work on the elastic constant. And so the, num the numbers that you see now, okay, the numbers that you see here may be a bit outdated, but so in this work uh, that was published in 2015, you have here uh, the elastic constants for roughly 1,200 compounds that were computed. And by the way, here, every time that you publish something on scientific data, you have to give a repository uh, that is supposed to last for at least 10 years. So things like uh, Nomad, the materials cloud, or in this case, uh, maybe the, the, these didn't exist at the time. And so they were put on a different website where the data is supposed to be stored for at least 10 years. So that's a requirement of scientific data. Um, if you look at piezoelectric constants, in this case, the number is even smaller. This is a work, again, by the same person. Again, it was published in scientific data, and so all the data, again, are available uh, on, on a website, at least. And also, they are available on a you know, nicer interface on the materials project. So either you recover the data uh, from the file that is cited in the paper, and you can download everything, or you can look at bros and on the materials project and have one material at a time. Then there's been also efforts on dielectric constants. In this case, again, published in 2017, scientific data. Again, you know, people trying to see if there were some trends in the data. This is a work that we continued, and for the people who were here at the Abinit workshop, you've seen this picture where we have computed the dielectric constant for uh, 4,000 compounds. Uh, those are, for the moment, are just available as a, as a, um, a CSV file. Hopefully we'll put that into a better shape later on, but the data is available with the paper. Then there's been uh, various efforts for uh, the phonons and vibrational efforts. There's been the work by uh, Togo, the work of Nicola uh, about uh, 2D materials, and our recent work um, about the phonons that are now on the materials project. And again, we gave all the data uh, in the article, that, and there's a, a repository where all the data that can be downloaded. So then once the, the, the data have been computed, in most of the cases, people make the effort to have an interface you know, which, where you can go and check different materials. So this is the interface of uh, the Togo database where you can click and you have certain properties that you can have there. Uh, Nicola showed us the, the materials cloud where you can see uh, phonome band structures. And on the materials project, we also have uh, uh, different uh, phonome band structures that are available. In most of the cases when it was possible, uh, all those work included also a validation. So meaning comparison with the available experimental data. In many cases, the amount of available experimental data is quite small. And so often it's a limited number of points, but still the effort was made. So this, in this case, it's uh, the elastic constant. So comparison of uh, the, the shear modulus and the, the bulk moduli. 
In this case, it's the uh, piezoelectric constant that have been compared here. Again, and in this case, the number of points is even smaller. <laughs> In the case of the dielectric constant, you can also compare different functionals in order to try to decide which one, you know, there's always the way we proceed. If we want to go for a high throughput calculation, we first do comparison of different functions in order to have a reasonable uh, agreement with the experiment when, when we have the data, and then we pick one of the functionals, and then we go high throughput for uh, many more materials. <coughs> so this is the work that, for instance, we did for the phonons. So, uh, you know, we could analyze, see the kind of error we have, uh, see, uh, you know, the outliers, what, what the problems were, and compare different functionals, again, here, PBSOL and PBE. Another thing that we need to do when we uh, to, uh, do these calculations is to check the convergence. That's really important. And here, for instance, uh, this is the work that uh, was done by uh, Petusis about dielectric constant, where he tested systematically different parameters of his calculation. It can be the density of k-point, the, uh, the energy cutoffs, the, the, the different parameters, and as a result, he can check, you know, how the, the error that are, that are being made on all the materials for which he tested. So you, you, you take a subset of the materials and try to get a sense of how converged they are. And I, I guess that's a bit what, what you were doing in your case. The same was done for phonons, where we checked the amount of uh, k-points that are needed to uh, get a certain average error, a relative error, an absolute error, uh, a maximum error both for the k-point sampling, for the q-point sampling, and as a result of that study that was done on a limited number of uh, materials, say 50 ma materials, we can get a sense that if we use a given density of k-point, say for instance here, then the uh, maximum error is going to be a given number of wave numbers. And then once we decide the accuracy, accuracy that we target for our high throughput calculation, then we start running the calculation based on the statistics that we have established before. So now in terms of verification of the code, as far as I know, very little was done, and the only paper that I'm aware of is this uh, comparison between uh, Abinit and Quantum Espresso that was carried on by Samuel Poncet, uh, Michel Coté, Xavier Gons, and others, and where they basically uh, looked at different quantities uh, systematically going from uh, phonon uh, frequencies and going up to electron phonon matrix element and characterizing the kind of, you know, differences that there were between the two codes. And so typically they ended up showing tables where they were comparing, so in this case it was Abinit version 7 and Quantum Espresso, comparing the different quantities at the level of the total energy, you know, we know the kind of things that we can agree, uh, that we the kind of uh, agreement that we can reach based on the, the Delta project effort. And then on the phonon frequencies they looked at what they could get and then also they looked at the um, electron phonon coupling elements trying to get a sense of the error that they were making. Obviously the question that arises from that is, okay, based on what we've seen this morning, we've seen a direction of, in, of increasing the, the check between uh, different codes in the delta uh, by increasing the kind of materials that uh, we are comparing from one code to another. The other direction is the the type of properties that we're comparing. And so one of the questions that arises when we compare different properties is what is the acceptable error between two codes? If I go back to here, I mean, I have no sense whether, you know, this 10 minus 2 is okay or not uh, for that specific uh, electron phonon coupling element. You know, we see we have a, a range here and there was a zoom in the paper where you could see that there, for some of them you actually reached the top of the bar here. Is this something acceptable or not? It's difficult to get a sense out of that. So which are the quantities that we should compare? Should we look at the macroscopic uh, results like elastic, dielectric, piezoelectric tensor? Should we look at uh, phonon frequencies 
phonon frequencies at specific points, say gamma, which is maybe too symmetric, maybe a zone boundary point, should we look at the phonon band structure and use something like the delta band that you are using for the, the, the band structure of the electrons and or something that like uh, uh, was introduced by uh, Antimo uh, and uh, Gianluca in the work that uh, Nicola was mentioning there. So should we do something like that? And then which material should we consider? Well, we can learn here from the, the go uh, delta gauge experience. And then maybe a more uh, provocative statement. Often, when you do uh, DFPT calculation, the, you, you, you know, the, the DFPT implementation has been validated by doing finite difference. And here I'm just showing a recent paper where there's been an implementation of um, a PAW DFPT for piezoelectric constant. And so the, the first thing that you do is that you compare your results of finite difference with DFPT. And so the question that I have is, do we actually really need to uh, do something, you know, test like we did for the total energies, other properties uh, in the same systematic way? Or, you know, based on the fact that the total energy agree and the fact that in principle, the DFPT is just similar to a finite difference, shouldn't we get something that is similar? And actually, I'm stopping here, leaving this question and opening the discussion. Thank you.